Hi, welcome back. Having reviewed coordinate systems and vectors, we are now going to look at how we can extend ideas from single variable calculus to these coordinate systems and, and, and we're going to extend it to uh, multivariable calculus, x, y, and z, or what's called vector calculus. So in single variable calculus you have a variable like x, right, and you do certain things to x, like you differentiate it, um, you know, you might have like x squared, some function of x, right? So you might differentiate x. Um, you also might integrate some function of x over x, right? And so we're going to extend uh, that those two ideas, differentiation and integration, to multivariable calculus. x, y, and z now are the variables. So let's get started with that. All right. So let's let's actually review just very briefly what it is that one of the main ideas from single variable calculus and and it goes like this let's say you have some variable and here's the number line for that variable so this is like the x axis okay and so i've i've got a dashed line for the number line and i've labeled it labeled it x now then and I'll, I'll just show it as above. It could be below, but you've got some other func or you've got some function uh, in blue here, f of x. And uh, the idea from from calculus, or one, you know, one of the big ideas, and ho hopefully you didn't just get lost in the um, you know the, the mechanical process. Hopefully, when you took calculus, you you understood the idea here is to um, approach some function. Uh, as being constant over some very small change in the domain. And what I mean by that is if we were to magnify this area and if we choose this change in x very small then what you'll see is, and, and even here in this picture, I've I've got the change in domain too large. But uh, if if I change if I if I choose it small enough, the change in x small enough, then f will be almost nearly constant if f is smooth. So if I you know if I magnify this thing. Here's x, right? And we call maybe this point is x. So here's x, and I've magnified it now, and we call we call this then x plus dx. And then this change in x, this very small change in x, we call that dx. All right. Again, let me say that the idea is that dx is so small, and we, we will often say that it's infinitesimally small, that a continuous function f is constant over that range of, that infinitesimally small range in x. So why is that important? Why, why, do, why do we need f to be constant? Why is that so important? And the reason is because sometimes we, we like to do things with f, like we, we like to um, for instance, find its length, like find the length of this blue path. Uh, another time, in other times, we want to maybe find the area underneath f. So these things have physical meanings depending on what f is trying to model, right? the area or the length of f. Well, we only know how to, you know, without calculus, we only know how to measure lengths that are straight. And we only know how to calculate areas that are rectangular. And so, if, if in this range, this small range in x, f is constant, well, we know how to measure the length of f then. The length is just dx. And then we know how to get the area underneath that. Uh, the area is dx times whatever that height is, f of x. So this is why we do that. And then, uh, then expanding on that idea, once you, once you calculate that thing or that quantity, for this small range in x, then you add you add them all up over your curve, and that's that adding of of them all up is called integration. 
right? So let me just say that again. dx is such a small change in x that f of x is constant between x and x plus dx. So this, us, this allows us to find the area of a rectangle, which is integration. Now, in this video, we're actually not going to be interested in f of x. What we're interested in is the domain here, or this, this x, this number line that I've drawn in a dotted line. So um, that's what this video is all about, actually. Just you know, How can it be just on, on this thing alone? But that's what it is. It's about the variable x. Because in three dimensions, we can have, um, you know, this this change in x, which we would, which is one dimensional. But we can also have like an area, of which is two dimensional, so like a change change in x and y at the same time, or or x and z, or y and z. That would be a, a change in area, and we can also have a change in volume, where x, at y, and z are all changing. So this is this is not. This is not about f, and this is not the area underneath f that I'm talking about. I'm talking about just the area you get when you change x by a little, little bit, and you change y. You know, maybe there's there's another axis here that comes out at you. Maybe the y-axis comes out at you. So now, if we change x by a little bit and we change y by a little bit, now we have this little differential area, and then on top of that, then might be some some function of those two variables, right? And so um, we're going to integrate uh, that function, for example. So that's what I mean by area now, is, is when our variables x and y change, or x and z change. So you can see now we're, we're interested in, in just the variables x, y, and z. And going back to the original case um, where, there, where there was just x, when I, when I use the word path, I'm talking about this path right here. Um, you don't call it a path in single variable calculus because that's kind of overdoing it. But now it becomes uh, crucial that you use the correct word because we're dealing with three variables. So I'm not talking about, when I say the word path now, I'm not talking about this thing, f. I'm talking about the path that x takes in going from x to x plus dx. It's really not a path at all, if you think about it, just because there's only one way to go, one dimension. But now we have several dimensions. Okay, so in general, we're go we're going to call the, and we'll get to these two figures in a second. We're going to call the differential, dif differential displacement. We're going to call that DL, and L displacement is a vector, right? And so uh, the differential DL vector, and that's going to be equal to. So now we're talking three dimensions. Our, all three variables can change. So for in instance, we can have a, a small change in the x direction. So that's represented by dx is the small change, and then we show in the x direction because this is a vector now, and we can have a small change in the y direction times a y like that, and we can have a small change in the z direction like this. So this is our differential displacement in Cartesian coordinates, and that should be straightforward now. If That's just an extension of single variable calculus. Now. Let me draw the x, y, z plane. So here's x, here's z, here's y. Let's suppose, um, let's suppose for right now both. Um, it's, I guess it's easier for me to show if, let's say z changes, like that, and y changes. So we have a very small incremental change in z, dz, and we have a very small incremental change in y, dy. So now we have an area, right? And we're going to call this thing the differential surface area. Surface area. 
and it's also going to be a vector so we have to give this not not only magnitude the area but we have to give it a direction and we're going to define the direction to be a vector that is normal a unit vector that is normal to this thing so if if y and z are changing like I've shown then normal to that is the x direction so this would be ax and also note that a minus x is also normal to this thing or, or minus ax like into the page is normal as well so um, just for convention we'll just say that uh, this surface area differential surface area d capital s is dy dz in the x direction that's the way it's defined so it, just keep in mind the direct we're given this area it seems weird to give an area a direction but we're giving the area a direction that is normal to that thing and we're gonna we're gonna just forget about the minus sign for right now we're gonna say it's along the positive x direction even though the negative x direction would be technically correct later we'll give we'll, we'll give um, directions to this maybe we we change by going up and then we change by going left and then we change by going down and then we change by going right and so then we'll use the right hand rule actually to um, to define that direction um, but that we don't need to do that for right now okay so that's that's the differential surface area when y and z are changing but let's consider I'll draw another set of axes here let's consider when uh, z and x are changing so if if x is changing then there's a change coming out at you like this and then if z is changing that's up and down like this so my drawings aren't very good but hopefully you get the idea so this would be a small change in x like that and this would be a small change in z and this is the surface area and then by convention you know the, the, we're going to use the normal that goes in the positive y direction like that instead of the negative y direction which should be to the left and so this surface area or this differential surface area ds now is dx a small change in x times a small change in z right just think about how you calculate area dx dz and then we're giving it the direction ay so notice the direction is the is the um, the, the variable that we're leaving off in the area calculation right we take dx times dz so what variable is left y so the direction is ay and then finally um, you know we can continue playing this game we have x z y again right and we can say that maybe y and x are changing so when x changes it comes out at you like this when y changes we go this way so we have something like this here's the area how do I get that area I take the the, the length times the width so that area is the length times the width dx dy and then again what variable is missing z and so we're going to say that we are use positive z like this we're going to define the surface area vector the surface area vector or the differential surface area vector like that okay so in, again in general uh, if the differential elements make area ds the differential surface area is ds equals ds like the magnitude times a normal vector right so in, in all three cases we, we we had a normal vector all right and finally you can imagine I'm not going to draw it now I've got too many drawings on the screen but you can you can imagine uh, if X and Y and Z all change then we would have a cube and we would call that the differential volume okay and the volume will say DV 
would just be dx, dy, and dz. And I'm going to point out here, I'm going to explicitly write it, this is a scalar. So we don't attach a direction to this thing. And the reason we don't attach a direction like we did um, surface area and displacement is uh, in three dimensions, you know, we're, so x is changing, y is changing, z is changing, what direction would we give that? It would have to extend into the fourth dimension, and we as humans can't even visualize that. See, let's back up. Let's look at the surface area, right? The y change and the z change, and so the area vector was in the third dimension, x, or the x change and the z change, and then the area vector was in the y. So when x, y, and z change, then the normal to that is actually in a fourth dimension, um, which we just we don't need and we can't visualize and we're not going to need it in this class. So whenever we talk about differential volume, it's going to be a scalar. We do not we do not attach a direction to that. Okay, feel free to pause the video, but I'm moving on. And I want to talk about cylindrical coordinates now. So you'll see my picture over here, and uh, we're getting to that in a second. But uh, let's recall a circle. Now we're going to need this idea for both the cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Let's recall a circle. Here's my, here's my circle. And uh, let's say it has a radius rho. And um, it cuts off this length that I'm going to draw in green, this arc length. Okay, and let's say the angle here is uh, phi, right, measured in radians. And the question is, what is the arc length given phi and given rho? Well, actually, this is, this is how the angle is defined um, in radians. This is how radians are defined, that it cut, when rho is equal to 1, it cuts off an angle, or it cuts off in length, given by the angle, like 2 pi radians is 2 pi around the circle. So actually the length here, just based on how radians are defined, is rho times phi. So now the, the reason we need that is that if we change phi by just a little bit just an incremental amount, d phi, we might ask what's the differential change in the length? And the differential change in the length then, uh, I'll just write d length for right now, would be rho times that differential change in phi. Okay, so keeping that in mind, again it comes from the definition of radians believe it or not. So if, if, if you want to go back and you know maybe Wikipedia and check out how radians are defined, um, you can you should do that. But then in cylindrical coordinates then the DL, right, what we're calling the differential displacement, it's given as, well, we could have a small change in the rho direction. We can have a small change in the phi direction, so we're going to write that as rho d phi in the phi direction. Again, note that that rho appears. You might not have been expecting that prior to this video, so that rho, keep that in mind, and that's coming from this arc length idea, plus, and then we've got regular old dz, a change in z in the z direction. Okay, so this is the differential displacement in cylindrical coordinates. And we can extend this to the surface area. Um, we can say rho d phi dz. So if, if phi changes, then the, the change in arc length is rho d phi, right, based on the same idea. And then if z changes, so we, we multiply with the arc length by z, so that gives us our surface area, and then we're going to give that a direction in rho. Rho is the only thing that's not changing here, that's the thing that's missing here. We have d phi, we have dz, so we're going to append uh, the direction a rho to that. 
And let's say, you know, you have to ask yourself, what is changing? So let's say, uh, let's say the radius is changing, rho, and let's say z is changing. So in that case, d rho, dz. Okay, and that would be in the phi direction. That's the variable that's missing. Or... Let's say we we have rho that's changing and phi that's changing. If phi's changing, we need a rho d phi, and then if phi's changing, we need a d rho. Okay, so then that would be in the z direction. So this is the differential surface area, and this is analogous to uh, what we had for rectangular coordinates. Notice we're picking up this rho. whenever phi changes and that's because of this arc length idea so here in my figure I've got a little differential volume that we're going to get to in a second but the the volume has these areas right that that uh, encapsulate the volume and so you can see you can see the, you know the face that's coming out at us has um, dimensions rho d phi and dz. So the area of that face that's coming out at us uh, is rho d phi times dz. So that's um, that's this first guy and we give it a dimension that's normal and so the normal dimension is a rho. So that's that first one. And then similarly you know it has a top and a bottom. The top and bottom um, are when uh, phi ch or when rho changes and when phi changes. So the top and bottom are these guys here when rho changes and phi changes and then the top and bottom point um, you know in the z direction and the sides the left and right are when uh, rho changes and z changes. So z goes up and down, rho goes you know in and out of the page and so that's this middle guy. Okay, so the volume now of this little blue kind of kind of cubish thing that I've drawn there, the differential volume. Well, this is when rho, phi, and z all change. So this is d rho d phi d z. But again, because phi is changing, I need an extra rho there to to incorporate this idea that the length is rho times d phi. And again, that's a scalar. I do not attach a direction to that thing. Okay, so keeping that idea in mind, let's move on to spherical coordinates now. So I've got this picture. You can see I've kind of uh, sliced this thing, so I've got this blue uh, differential volume there. But we'll get to the volume in a second. Now, as as in previous spherical coordinates um, analysis that we did, uh, you know, we took the radius r and we projected it into the xy plane. I talked about that quite a bit. And remember that uh, that the radius was uh, was r sine of phi, so or sine of theta. Remember the rad the radius in the xy plane, which is precisely rho, was r sine theta, right? theta is given in this picture that's the colatitude angle right so when we take when we take the radius times the sine of that angle we project the dimension down into the xy plane so so the reason i'm bringing that up is because once you understand that then the differential displacement you can use cylindrical the same idea from cylindrical coordinates that uh, we we can change um, a little bit by in the r direction okay but then theta and phi are both angles so now we we have to use this idea again of arc length so this is r d theta in the theta direction and then in the phi direction what's the radius in the phi direction it's this thing so we would say r theta d phi a phi 
like that. That's the differential length in spherical coordinates. And just extending the, this idea from cylindrical, if, um, if both of the angles change and r is held constant, then we pick up r d theta, okay, and we pick up r sine theta d phi, so that makes it an r squared. So actually, let me rewrite this. So we pick up the r squared sine theta d theta d phi, and then that would be in the r direction. Okay, so that's when r is constant. So that's one of the faces on this, uh, this little differential volume that I've carved out. If we hold um, theta constant and we let r change and phi change, so r and phi change, then we've got r sine theta dr d phi in the theta direction. And finally, if we hold phi constant and we let r and theta change, we've got r dr d theta in the phi direction. So this is the differential surface elements or the differential surface areas in spherical coordinates. So these would define the six sides of this thing that I've carved out. Then finally the differential volume. So if all three of these things change then I just multiply them all together. So I pick up an r squared and I pick up a sine theta and and then I've got dr d theta and d phi and again there is no direction there. Alright so now that we have the the, the basic um, differential length area and volume, remember this is all about the, how the coordinates change this is not about integrating yet or differentiation, we did no differentiation or integration here so we're going to use these concepts, this is the dx part of single variable calculus so now we've got dx and we've got dl and we've got ds and we've got dv so now we're going to, we're ready to start integrating and differentiate differentiating